Welcome to Board Game Casual and the grand finale of our one year anniversary extravaganza. I hope you've been enjoying all the videos as part of the special. They've been a lot of work, but a lot of fun to make. I've got the link to the one year anniversary extravaganza playlist down in the description in case you wanted to go back and check out any videos you might have missed. You guys are awesome. At the beginning of the celebration, I put it out there that I needed your help because I really wanted to conclude the anniversary with a video of viewer Q&A and you guys delivered. I got a ton of great questions from you and in this video, I'm answering them. Here we go. At Brandon Graham writes, in real life, do people comment on how much you talk with your hands or do you only do it because of the top down? <laughs> so here's a story. Back when I was in high school, I was sitting on a park bench talking to my at-the-time girlfriend. Suddenly, this random lady came up to me and asked, Hey, do you sign? She said it verbally as well as gesturing in what I assume was American Sign Language. So I guess I've always been a bit hand expressive while talking. That said, because I'm sort of limited in filming top-down, I do try to be mindful of my hand placement and certainly don't want a video of just a static game box or my hands resting still on the table. But yeah, generally speaking, talking with my hands is pretty natural for me. At Constant Chaos Games writes, Congrats! I do like the reviews, but I think my favorite aspect of your channel is the design perspective. I like the prototyping tips, the graphic design input on games, etc. My questions would be about game design. Tell us more about any games you're working on, games you've designed in the past that you're pleased with, and some that you've had to shelve and why. What types of mechanisms or themes have you gravitated with? First of all, shout out to Constant Chaos Games. I feel like he's been watching since pretty much the beginning, always comments on videos with nice things to say, and if you haven't seen his channel yet, be sure to go check it out. He's got a mind for designing solitaire games that just blows me away. Solo game design is definitely not one of my strengths. I'm so glad to hear you're a fan of the Design Diaries series. I'm very proud of that series, and I hope it helps distinguish my channel out there from the many others. Okay, as for your questions about the games I'm working on and the game designs I've shelved, I don't want this to sound like a cop-out, but I definitely have plans to talk about more of my personal designs, for better or worse, in future videos where I can go into more detail. So stay tuned for those. In the meantime, here's a few in brief. I've been working on a gladiator-themed game. Well, two actually, but this one is currently named Ludus Road to the Colosseum. In this game, you're managing a house, or gladiator stable, recruiting and training gladiators, sending them to fight in tournaments for glory and riches, ultimately trying to be the most famous and most profitable of all the other houses you're competing against. This is definitely one of my bigger projects. It's got a lot of different moving parts and mechanics, buying and selling warriors and weaponry, building out your accommodations, training and specialization, different areas or levels of arenas to compete in, and managing your influence to secure notable or favorable spots in tournaments. And ideally, I'd like there to be different strategies for players to consider and multiple paths to victory. Are you focusing on having the most dominant popular gladiators among the people? Are you the go-to house that specializes in training a specific class of gladiators? You know, maybe you're the house of the trident. Or maybe your house is a little more scrappy, focusing on providing the beasts, like lions and tigers, to the arena, or ensuring that prisoner executions go as planned. These types of things might not bring your house much glory, but they can be quite profitable and might earn you some favor with the emperor. On the opposite side of the spectrum, I'm also working on a lighter sumo-themed game. I'm a big fan of sumo, and the idea popped in my head for a lightweight, smaller game that I'm hoping will work in real life like it does in my head. It's kind of nice to be able to switch back and forth to working on a simple game when I start to feel overwhelmed designing bigger games. That said, the biggest problem is just finding time to sit and work on games in general. As for an example of a game I've shelved, well, I've talked about this one a couple of times in previous videos, which is currently named Throws of Battle. This is another big game that had a lot going on in terms of resource and engine management, side quests, end game goals, but at its core, I wanted to build a head-to-head -head dice battler, 
where you build up a big army of dice that represent your warriors, and then you have this fast-paced dice-rolling shootout when you collide with another player's army. My favorite part about the system is that there were three different consequences of defeat. The soldier might die, in which case it's out of the game. The soldier might retreat, which means at least you can heal them and use them again later. Or they might defect, being won over by your opponent, and now your opponent gains that soldier as one of their warriors. Aside from knowing that my game had way too many dice to ever be published, the biggest problem with the game is that the way I tried to balance and scale up the dice resulted in way too many ties. It really bogged the gameplay down. Just way too many stalemates for something that was supposed to be fast paced. On top of that, I was then exposed to the game Champions of Midgard, which actually had a lot of similarities to what I was trying to design. And of course, in a much more elegant game. So I ended up shelving Throws of Battle. At some point, I'd like to come back to it, since I think it still has potential, and I've got a lot of new ideas for how to simplify things. Thanks again for the great questions, and I'll be talking about my games more in detail in future videos. At John Laforga writes, Question. Is Warhammer too hardcore to see in this board game casual channel? I think it would be great to see some classic Warhammer or D&D &D reviews. I don't play Warhammer or Dungeons and Dragons. I certainly wouldn't say they're too hardcore, and to me they're all part of the bigger tabletop board gaming hobby. It's just not something that's in my wheelhouse. I do think those miniature games look pretty cool, especially when they've got these big armies of troops moving around, so maybe someday I'll have the opportunity to try one sometime. Board and Scale, an interesting podcast and YouTube channel that combines their love of board games and their love of breeding snakes, writes, Congrats on the anniversary. I've really enjoyed following your channel. My question is, are you going to do videos on or go to any conventions? Could be board game ones or any conventions in general. Wishing you another great year. User at JGutKind also has a similar question. What conventions, if any, are you planning to attend? You know, I have never been to a board game convention. I'm not super into big crowds where you're paying a big entrance fee just to see a bunch of vendors who are then trying to sell you more stuff. And I don't want to insult anyone, maybe this is totally untrue, but I've also heard stories about, um, convention smells. Nevertheless, going to a board game convention is always on the back of my mind as something I need to try. Those dice tower conventions, for example, seem pretty appealing. They look like a welcoming place to learn and play games. To be totally honest, and let me know if anyone else feels this way, part of me is a bit worried. As much as I like board games, I'm not sure I like them enough to sit down and play with total strangers. I typically like playing with my friends over a few drinks. It's how we get together and spend time with each other. But hey, maybe gaming at a convention is the perfect opportunity to make new friends. I do have a buddy who's always inviting me to go with him to Gen Con or BGG Con, so hopefully I'll make it out to a convention sooner than later. And certainly having someone else to go with would ease a lot of my nerves. If and when I do make it to a convention, you can be sure that I'll make a video or two about it. Some additional questions from at JGutKind. Do you ever plan to show your face on the channel? I hope to in the future. A lot of why I don't film my face just has to do with logistics and letting the channel prove itself first. In order to film myself, in addition to filming the games, I really need more than one camera. I need different lighting, and I kind of need to figure out a different spot to film with a decent backdrop. I actually have my back to a big sliding glass door, so if the camera were in front of me, you'd just see a washed out silhouette. These are all things I have plans for as the channel grows. I recently made a video on how excited I am for the channel to be monetized, since that will slowly help me save up for a new camera and more equipment. Eventually, I hope to have a multi-cam setup and even create some videos with co-hosts. But since I'm just filming with my iPhone for now, I try to keep things simple. And besides, I want to make sure that the primary focus is on the games or whatever it is I'm talking about. What made you want to start a board game channel to begin with? I talked a bit about this in the 500 subscriber celebration video. I had the idea for a long time. I love making videos, I've had some decent success with other YouTube channels in the past, and I've always had an itch to create a channel about board games. Secondly, while I have a lot of hobbies, 
Board gaming is the one hobby that is heavily dependent on other people's availability. So the Board Game Casual channel is a nice way to scratch that board gaming itch, giving me an outlet to talk and think about board games even when I don't have others to game with. Third, I figured it would be a great way to share and get feedback on my own game designs and game design methods. Lastly, I've learned so much from all the other board game content creators out there, I was really excited to participate and hopefully give something back to the community. Do you have any plans for your channel that will set you apart from other board game channels? A lot of other board game channels are really hardcore into the hobby constantly focused on the new hotness and latest Kickstarter releases. And hey, that's great. I mean, I depend on a lot of these other channels to see what new games I personally might be interested in. But that can sometimes feel a bit overwhelming or intimidating, especially to folks who are just starting to get into board games. So I'm really hoping that what sets my channel apart is a more casual approach to board games. I'm a retail buyer, especially when I can get games on sale. I like talking about games that are easily attainable, and I try to stay away from the FOMO. Board games don't always have to be the focus of an event, but are a great activity as part of a party or a night together with friends or family. I hope to welcome new gamers into the hobby, as well as seasoned gamers who share similar tastes. It's come up a few times now, but I also hope that the Design Diary series and documenting games I'm working on myself also helps set my channel apart. In terms of looking ahead, I certainly have no shortage of ideas. I'd love to do some videos where I bring in cocktail recipes, for example, and maybe even do more board game entertainment type shows. Thank you at JGutKind for all the great questions. Hi, Wombat929 on BGG here. Some questions for the Q&A. What games are on your shelf of opportunity slash shelf of shame? If you had a time bubble in which you had the ideal group player count, and life opportunity, aka time, to play one of the games on that shelf, which would you play right now? In case you missed it, I recently did a video on the top 10 games from my shelf of shame that I set out to play at the beginning of the year and the progress I've made so far. Though I will say there's even more unopened games on my shelf beyond that list. If I had the time and ideal group to play one of the remaining games on my shelf of shame. Well, Long Shot the Dice Game would certainly be up there because that would mean I'd have a nice big group to try this one out with. I always love a big game group and have been saving this one for just such an occasion. However, I think my top answer would actually be Moonrakers. I've heard this game is best at four or five players and is very group dependent since this game is all about negotiation and temporary alliances. I don't play a lot of games like this, so I think having the ideal group and player count would be key to having the best experience. What are your three favorite game mechanisms and your favorite game for each mechanism? Oh man, only three? Okay, off the top of my head. I love deck building. And even though there are tons that I love, I think Runestones is one of my favorites and is worth mentioning since it's a lesser known game. But shout out to Mystic Veil vale and Lost Runes of Arnak. For number two, I don't know if there's a formal name for this, but I really like a downstream flowing card market where you can take the first card for free or drop a coin or a good on each card you want to skip to take a card from higher up the line instead. This appears in so many games like Architects of the West Kingdom, but I'll say my favorite is the classic Sentry Golem Edition. And finally, for my third favorite mechanism, I love when you get stuff on other people's turns. And my favorite game that's all about this is Space Base. And since we're talking about Space Base, I also love that mechanism where you can choose to activate either the sum of the two dice that you roll or each die face separately. That choice is so simple, but so fun. So there's a bonus one for you. At Harbor Loot writes, congrats on 100 videos in the first year. Hey, thank you so much and thank you for all your support along the way. If anyone watching is in the market for some great board game accessories, go check out Harbor Loot. There's a link down in the description. Question number one, you've played a lot of new games since Catan. What are your two favorite game mechanics that you love to see in games? Hey, <laughs> looks like uh, Wombat99 beat you to the punch on that one. I just talked about my top three. Question number two, if you were to design your dream game this year, would you start with a game mechanic you love and build out from there, or start with a theme you would like to bring to life, even if you couldn't include your top two game mechanics? 
Wow, this is actually a really tough question. I'm very much a mechanic first designer, or at least a theme that's inspired because of a mechanic. So normally, I'd say designing my dream game would start with a mechanic first. That said, some of those games I mentioned earlier, I've dug so much into the theme and have already been throwing away some mechanics that didn't work, I'm almost inclined to say I'd rather see one of these games become a reality and ditching two of the mechanics for ones that actually work. But hmm, I'm gonna stick with my gut here and say I'd rather start with the mechanic and go from there. When I think about games in general, I think more about their mechanics than I do their theme. And as a designer, when you pitch games, you have to be prepared for a publisher to strip away the theme and retheme it anyway. So mechanic first. Up next is a special audio submission from one of my favorite new podcasts, The Misplay. If you're not familiar, The Misplay Journals host Jason and Mark as they try to design a board game from scratch and start a board game company. It's a great listen. They've got an active Discord. Be sure to check them out. Dear Board Game Casual, First of all, we'd like to say congratulations on a year of content. Well done. And we know that in one of your videos recently, you were looking for questions from your faithful audience. We, as your faithful audience, have questions for you. We do. Starting with, if you were starting again, so go back a year, you're starting all over again, what would you go back and tell yourself? I'd say go buy some external terabyte hard drives. You're gonna need them sooner than you think, otherwise you'll find yourself having to constantly delete footage you wish you could keep in order to make enough room to process whatever video you're currently working on. If you've ever had days where you've been low on inspiration, what have you gone to or where have you found inspiration for the, the piece of insight that gives you the idea for the next video? Honestly, even before I created my first video, I put together such a long backlog of things I wanted to do on the channel, I feel like there's no shortage of ideas. I actually keep a running list in Google Sheets, and anytime a new idea pops in my head, I just add it to the backlog. That said, a lot of the videos I've made along the way come from my day-to-day -day experiences gaming. For example, I bought that Amazon game mat on a whim because I had some friends coming into town. And I was so impressed with it, I wanted to share it. I found big weekends of gaming as an opportunity to talk about what I've played and compare the games to each other. And recently, I even got an idea from one of your episodes. Jason was talking about how he had always heard the term tableau, but never quite knew what it meant. It got me thinking about maybe doing some beginner-friendly videos on explaining common board game terminology. Hey, if you think that's a good idea, let me know down in the comments. And lastly, for somebody like myself who you know looks at the analytics of our podcast, how do you use your analytics to influence your decision making? Whether that's YouTube, whether that's Instagram, how do those things affect the types of videos that you're going to record and put out? And congratulations on a year. It's a big task to make content so consistently for an entire year. So bravo. Keep it going. You sound like a Hallmark greeting card. That's, uh, that's the brand I go for. Deadpan. But it is a big accomplishment. For sure. Oh man, thank you so much. Great question. While I'm looking at YouTube analytics every day, how they apply to my decision making is still really only happening at the macro level. Even though we're here currently celebrating Board Game Casual's one year anniversary, the channel is very much still in its infancy. I'd go so far as saying that I'm still in the testing phase, seeing if the channel can be viable and self-sustainable. There's a lot that I wanna do with the channel, but of course I can't do it all at once. And some ideas require much bigger time and resource investment than others. So I've broken this into phases and milestones, each with a measurable goal. I mentioned earlier, for example, that when I started the channel, I had no idea if there would be an audience. And I gave myself a goal of one year, putting as much as I can into making content to reach monetization. So these first 365 days have been all about watching the subscriber count, views, and watch hours. Luckily, I've been fortunate enough to hit that goal, which means great, I can proceed to the next phase next test. If instead I were sitting here with 500 subs and only 2,000 watch hours, then I would have to reevaluate my goals, how much time I put into the channel, and maybe switch to more of a slow burn plan, letting things happen over time. And of course, if all I got were three subs telling me how much I suck, well, at least I tried. 
Heading into year two, my eyes will be on how much revenue YouTube monetization and other channel related revenue actually brings in, growth rates, etc. My new goal is to see if the channel can bring in enough to buy a new camera, hopefully in a year's time, and tracking at a rate where being able to buy some additional production equipment, light stands, tripods, etc., would be quick to follow. This would open up a whole new category of videos and shows I want to shoot, and maybe even lead into building a more dedicated studio to shoot in. That said, I also think this is a pretty aggressive goal. So based on the data and the ROI, maybe I'll find the balance is such that I just keep doing what I'm doing for a little while, and that to me is fine. I'm sure as time goes by and the channel grows, making analytic-based decisions will become more of a factor in the day-to-day. -day. In fact, now that I think about it, I have been playing around a little with YouTube's thumbnail A-B testing tool, where you can create multiple thumbnails for a video that run at the same time to see which one performs better. The one thing I want to avoid, however, is becoming a slave to the metrics, where I'm only creating videos that I think will get the most views. Board Game Casual, to me, is a hobby and a a fun creative outlet. The videos I make are because I want to make them. Sure, some might not get a ton of views, but if I had fun making it and even just a few people see it and think it's either interesting or helpful, that's what means the most to me. I think that trying to chase views is a slippery slope. It can stifle creativity and quickly becomes a path that is no longer fun. I think that's why there's a big rash of YouTuber burnout lately. Okay, that was a really long answer. My apologies if you got bored listening to me talk too much shop. Thank you again to Jason and Mark. Keep up the awesome work on the misplay. And finally, a question from at Feathers Fur. That's my girlfriend Kathleen. You can check out her channel if you're interested in the different wildlife that comes to our backyard. If you can pick one game's mechanics combined with a different game's art, what would they be? Great question. Some folks might be offended by this one, but I would choose the game Wonderland's War, but with the art and theme from Blood Rage. After playing Wonderland's War, it made me realize I don't like the combat and drafting and Blood Rage by comparison. But the Alice in Wonderland theme does nothing for me personally, and I like the Viking Ragnarok theme and art so much better. So if you took Wonderland's War and it had Blood Rage's art, it would probably be my favorite favorite dudes on a map board game. By the way, on a more general note, anytime I see kind of a dull or darker game board that's of a landscape, I always wished it looked more like a Shem Phillips game. The bright, vibrant boards of Raiders of the North Sea or Architects of the West Kingdom are so much more visually appealing to me. I wish all landscape game boards looked like these. Thank you to everyone who took the time to submit such interesting and thoughtful questions. That was a lot of fun. I hope I was able to answer them to your liking. As we wrap up the board game casual one year anniversary extravaganza, I just wanna thank each and every one of you who's been watching and supporting the channel along the way. When I kicked off the extravaganza a few weeks ago, I mentioned how the channel had just over 1,100 subscribers, and now we're already around 1,250 subs. So seeing the channel grow feels amazing, and I can assure you there's a lot more to come, so stay tuned. Thank you again for watching, thank you for liking and subscribing, and I'll see you next time here on Board Game Casual. Mark, since you started this as a letter, dear, sincerely, Mark and Jason, from the misplay? You missed. <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> you wanted me to say it at the same time? I was hoping. The misplay. <laughs> we make misplays.